God's grace and mercy and peace belong to all of you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus. Amen. Today we're going to talk about Jesus Christ as our King in our second lesson from Colossians chapter 1, beginning here at verse 13. For He, God the Father, has rescued us from the dominion of darkness, and He's brought us into the kingdom of the Son He loves, in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. Jesus, then, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for by him all things were created, things in heaven, things on earth, visible, invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers and authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. These are the words of God. In the name of Jesus Christ, our King, my dear Christian friends, what would you do if you were king for a day? Uh, haven't you ever wondered that before? Maybe you found yourself actually saying that, you know, you're in a moment and you say, you know, if they made me king for a day, they, I would change this. What would you do? What really would you do if you had a 24-hour reign where you got to make all the decisions and call all the shots? Uh, maybe that's a little bit of a complicated question because there's a lot of things, you know, that come as far as uh, perks as far as being a king. I mean, after all, a king, you know, he has all of the pleasures and leisures at his disposal. And so would you use your 24 hours to take advantage of, you know, the perks of being a king, the fleshly satisfactions? You have the harem. You have probably your own cook. You have all the finest choice wines and foods at your disposal. You want some entertainment? Snap your fingers. You can have music. You can have dance. You can have shows. You can have plays. You can have jesters or comedians. You can have anything you want. You can invest your, you can invest your 24 hours satisfying the fleshly things. Or maybe you're cut from the power cloth. If I'm the king, there's some things that are going to change around here. No longer are we going to be driving around this city. We're going to start building some freeways. And we're not going to be able to drive on a road where it changes its name five times within three miles. Things are going to change. If you had the absolute authority, are you going to write the, ping, the, the king's pen and sign into law dictates and issues and decrees? Are you going to go environmental? Are you going to say we need to recycle and conserve water and we need solar power and people need to con conserve more? I mean, what are you going to do? What are you, you're the king. You're the king. What are you going to do? Some enterprising person in here invariably has to come up with this one. This is usually the one the teens come up with. If I were the king, I would wire transfer all the treasury into my personal checkbook. <laughs> so that when my 24 hours is done, it's still all mine. And they're always very sad when you point out, well, that's all well and good until the next king for a day comes in the next day and takes it from your checkbook and puts it in theirs. Doesn't that all illustrate why it's, it's a really bad idea to make me a king for a day and probably a really bad idea to make you a king for the day? Because we'd act selfishly. We'd act probably in our own best interest. We'd satisfy our own cravings. Or if we made decrees or issues or dictates, you know, we're going to make the things that really aggravate us, the pet peeves. We got a list of peeves and we're going to take care of all that when we're a king for a day. Is that what makes a good king? Satisfying the list of pet peeves? No. Isn't it true that if you're actually going to be a useful king, you have to put your arrogance aside and in humility serve your constituents? Isn't it true that if you're going to be a king, you have to act in the best interests of your people? Which is why in human history there haven't been a whole lot of very good kings, have there been? 
because they're all corrupted by the power or they want the fame or they want the fortune or the treasury or the lust. I mean, how many good kings have you had in human history? What are they known for? Imperialism. We've expanded the kingdom. My soldiers are stronger than your soldiers and I can do some empire building. What have kings in history done? They've built things out. Really? Builders. That's why we remember people in history? Because they make hanging gardens or a fancy zoo? This is what we want our king. And then we sit here today and we say, well, I've never seen the wonders of the world. They don't look so fancy to me. And you know, you kind of look at the pyramids and you say, meh, okay, scratch it off the bucket list. But it doesn't really do much for me. Don't you need something more? Perhaps that's why the Apostle Paul speaks as he does in our text today. Because when you compare the things that we value about earthly kings, it's so vapid, it's so passing, it's so limited, and honestly, it's so tied to selfishness and greed and lust and, and, and money and power and corruption that you, kinda, you, you almost come away saying, I'm not sure I even want the job. Not so with King Jesus. You know, all of the other earthly kings, you kind of scratch your head and you say, I'm not so sure that I really would want me or you or this guy or that lady to be my king or my queen. But with Jesus, Jesus, this is a king that we all need. And the Apostle Paul explains to us precisely why. Because with Jesus Christ, he is all sufficient. And secondly, with Jesus Christ, he has the supremacy. He is all supreme. Now, the Apostle Paul, you've got to keep in mind, is writing to a Colossian congregation who were wrestling with a number of things that were unique to their congregation. Some false teachings, some heresies, a lot of cultural, cultural issues that were going on. You see, part of the thing that the Colossians were wrestling with is, is they were buying into Christianity, but they were buying into Christianity and Jesus as one option of many. And frankly, they thought that they could believe in Jesus, but they, they were kind of taking the attitude that he can be blended together with a lot of the thoughts and teachings that were going on in their culture at the time. So you take a little bit of Roman mythology, you take a little bit of a Greek philosophy, and you mix it together with kind of the conventional wisdom at the time, and you know Jesus can kind of be blended together with all of these other things. And the Apostle Paul, as he writes, and maybe this is kind of connecting with you from what we read just a little bit ago, is kind of pounding the table and he's saying, no, no, no! You do not blend Jesus together with everybody else and he is one king marginalized side by side with human wisdom. No, no, no! Jesus Christ is a king that we all need, exclusively so. Get rid of all of those other imposters and don't blend Jesus together with any other kind of thing. What you need is a Jesus Christ because he's all sufficient. Listen to how the apostle explains that in the first verse that we read. For our father has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves. In whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Look at what Jesus Christ, our King, has done. He's rescued us. He's actually bought us back from an enemy, sin. Now, the philosophies of the day can philosophize about where did evil come from, and they can come up with notions about where it existed and how it began, but you know what they don't do? They don't give you a solution. They don't talk about how actually you overcome evil and how you conquer evil. Paul says that this Jesus Christ, King Jesus, is all sufficient as the king you need because he actually rescues you from the power of darkness. And he brings you into the kingdom of Jesus Christ, the son he loves. He buys you back from sin when he died on the cross to forgive you. Look what he said. In Jesus we have redemption and the forgiveness of our sins. Mythology didn't offer that whether it was Greek or Roman, the philosophers had no such thing. There was no conventional wisdom. Only with King Jesus do you have an all-sufficient solution to the problem of devil and darkness and evil and sin. And the Apostle Paul says, this is why you hitch your wagon to Jesus Christ and you get rid of all the other stuff because Jesus Christ is a king all by himself. He is all-sufficient. You probably understand that it's not just the Colossians who have to wrestle with 
these sorts of things. I mean, the devil is just as well alive today as he was back in the days of the Colossians. And he wants to tempt and lure and dupe you into thinking that Jesus in your heart and in your life can be shared. And he can stand side by side with conventional wisdom. And I'll have my Jesus, but, you know, my, my horoscopes and those things, I, those things are still, you know, what I, I need to consult for, for daily advice and wisdom. It's Jesus and, see? I'll take Jesus, but I still like my, my meditation and my yoga. I'll take my Jesus, but I like to mix them together with, you know, a variety of other things. Progress, right? We're, we're much more enlightened today now than we've ever been. And Jesus is one part of my religious experience who is blended together with many other things. Maybe that's exactly why we need to turn our attention back to the Colossians to have Paul say, no, no, no! Jesus Christ does not play side by side with anybody. Jesus is all sufficient. There is nothing else in our day and age today, neither was there in the day and age that the Colossians lived, in which Jesus is, is side by side as though he's a buddy or a partner with any of these other things. It's only Jesus Christ who died on the cross. It's only Jesus Christ who came out of heaven. It's only Jesus Christ who paid, made satisfaction for sin. It's only Jesus Christ who brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. It's only Jesus Christ who made redemption and Open the kingdom of heaven to us. And what the Apostle Paul would say to you and me today is exactly what he said to the Colossians. Jesus is the only king we all really need. And he is sufficient for all of our daily needs. Probably the reason why Paul makes the case that he does, that Jesus Christ is all sufficient, is because of what he unfolds in the second half of our devotion this morning. That Jesus Christ is all supreme. Now keep in mind that so far as the Colossians were going, remember there, there was all these things spooking around and, and goofing up their theology. One of which was the notion that after God, and I'll say small g, you know, I'm talking from the Colossians conception, after God, the supreme being, had created everything, there were all kind of these emanations. Um, maybe for lack of a better term, this is kind of difficult to understand what they were wrestling with. But there were these emanations. There was kind of like these middle beings. The, uh, we'll call them maybe angels is maybe the closest uh, approximation that we would have. And, and those middle beings or angels were responsible for the destinies and the fate of human beings. See? And so back in the days of the Colossian, this popular notion or this popular belief then was that you would actually have to bow down and bend the knee and appease, you know, those middle beings or those angels or those emanations. And you got to make them happy. After all, I, you know, they're responsible for your destiny. And so the way the Apostle Paul addresses that sort of thing, to kind of rip that stuff out of their hearts and say, you drop it at the door and you leave it behind, is talking about the all-supreme nature of Jesus Christ. He says, Jesus is the image of the invisible God and the firstborn over all creation. You see what the Apostle Paul says? There's not even a logical argument. We're not even going to take a theological argument. There's not even a logical argument for you to put Jesus side by side. Because even if what you Colossians suggest is true, that there's these middle beings or these angels that you need to bend the knee to, they're still created. But Jesus Christ is the creator. He is God himself. He's not a representation of God. He is God himself. He's the exact image of God. So why would you pull Jesus down and put him side by side and mix him with, any, with anything else when he's supreme? He goes on in verse 15, uh, 16 and said, By Jesus all things were created, things in heaven, things on earth, visible, invisible, whether thrones. Now, now these are a description in the Bible here about angels. These words refer to angels. Thrones, powers, rulers, authorities. These were all created by Jesus and for Jesus. You see the argument that the Apostle Paul is unfolding? Jesus is supreme to everything in all creation. 
And so you Colossians who are spending your time supposing that you pull Jesus down and put him side by side and equal and you mix him with all these other things, throw that all away. Jesus is bigger than them. He is God. All of these created things owe their existence to God. And so you bend the knee not to the created things. You bend the knee to Jesus Christ because he's the creator of everything. Go straight to the top, King Jesus and God himself. Secondly, in the second half of uh, he, in the second half of his argument here, Jesus is the king of creation but he's also before all things in verse 17. And in him all things hold together. This was really a powerful argument that Paul was unfolding because as far as these Colossians were concerned, you know, we, we have to bend the knee to the here and now. We have to, cap we have to capitulate to our culture. You see what Paul is explaining? Really? You, you want to drag Jesus down to be like a contemporary solution? Just for the here and now, well, for your 50 or 60 years while you live on earth? And, and, and you want to maneuver him and shape him into being whatever your mind desires? Jesus is eternal. He's before all things. He existed before anything else was created. You see why this is a God, this is a king that we all need? Because he precedes us. He precedes creation. He existed before anything else did. And so the kingdom that he establishes is also eternal. It's not contemporary. It's not for the here and now. It existed before you. It will exist after you. And so this King Jesus is supreme to whatever else you might want to drag him down into this earth and life. You don't, you don't form Jesus into your culture now. You understand that he precedes and succeeds anything else in your life, not because he's eternal God. And finally, God was pleased to have the fullness of God dwell in Jesus Christ and through him to reconcile all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through Jesus' blood shed on the cross. The reason why Jesus is a supreme king to any other thing that the Colossians believed or any other thing that we believe today too is because Jesus in his royal kingship acts and behaves completely unlike any other king we know. Remember how we illustrated that in the beginning? We would invariably abuse power. We would invariably be greedy. We would invariably want to make a name for ourselves and chase after fame. We would act in our own best interest, but maybe not in the best interests of our constituency. Maybe we think we're acting in the best interests of our constituency, but we don't have a mind for what went before or a mind for what will follow after us. When kings act and behave, they use their power to abuse other nations and take over other territories. Well, maybe that's good for this kingdom, but you're disrupting other kings and kingdoms on earth. Jesus, Jesus satisfies all that because in his supremacy, he makes peace between God and man. He made peace by his blood that he shed on the cross. That didn't just benefit some people, but not others. That wasn't only good for people on one side of the Mississippi, but not on the other side of the Mississippi. What Jesus Christ did is he made peace between God and man for all people of all time. People in the Old Testament, people in the New, our, our ancestors and our success, the people who will be born many years into the future. The supremacy of Jesus Christ is demonstrated because the work that he does as our king is a solution to all of the world's problem and opens the door to heaven for every single person of all time. Now that's not something that anybody else has done. And you know what else? As the children confessed when they were up here, the way Jesus expanded and extended his eternal kingdom was not by putting all of us or making all of us sacrifice ourselves for the good of the king, but the king sacrificed himself for the good of the people. 
You see why this is a king that we all need? I don't want the job. You don't want me to want the job. I don't want you to want the job. We, we'd all blow it and we'd all botch it. And you know, it's kind of fun to talk about maybe in context. Listen, we want Jesus Christ as our king. This is the king we need. This is the one who we need sitting at the right hand of God, ruling all things for our good, not just for 24 hours, but for all eternity. Because Jesus is all sufficient. He's everything we need. And Jesus is all supreme. He's the creator, the king of the universe. And he's the king of our salvation by making peace through his blood. Amen.